Visiting Australia this week is Dr Peter Whitehouse. He's one of the world's foremost experts on this condition. He's the founder of the University Alzheimer's Centre at Case Western Reserve University based in the US. He's also co-author of the controversial and pot-stirring book The Myth of Alzheimer's, What You Aren't Being Told About Today's Most Dreaded Diagnosis. Peter Whitehouse, welcome to breakfast. Good to be here with your listenership as well. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you in the Breakfast Studio. Your book, The Myth of Alzheimer's, was published in 2008, and it surprised a lot in your field, and it angered many, too, of your colleagues. What's basically you know, your argument that Alzheimer's is a myth? How do you come to that? Right. What I'm not saying is that it is common that older people lose their memories. Uh, I'm also not saying that this is not a huge social challenge, but I am saying that how we frame that social challenge is really important. The myth is, uh, quite frankly, just two things, and it's actually not that controversial. The title is controversial, but most experts do not believe that Alzheimer's disease is a single biological condition. So we should at least be talking about the heterogeneity of Alzheimer's diseases um, in order to encompass the findings we have had in the last three decades, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many people. The other part that's more controversial is the relationship between these entities and normal aging processes, because despite a lot of research trying to find the magic identifier, you know, you have Alzheimer's or you don't, we haven't been able to find it. And that, in my opinion, is because these processes that we lump under this single label are intimately related to the processes that we all go through to one degree or another. Okay, so you're arguing about the, uh, the, the, the word disease being there. You're not arguing with a generic description of something called Alzheimer's which is deterioration of the brain function, the brain. That's correct. It used to be called uh, senility or senile dementia. People get confused by the word dementia and the word Alzheimer's for good reason, because doctors themselves are uh, puzzled about what's the appropriate uh, labels to put on uh, these conditions. Which Can we do- divert there? Can you tell us what is the difference? Between... Dementia and Alzheimer's? Sure. Well, I mean, dementia is a, allegedly a broader category meaning that you can have cognitive or thinking difficulties as a result of numerous uh, insults to the brain, be it a stroke or head injury. So it's more general. People used to say that Alzheimer's was the most common form, but Alzheimer's is also a somewhat miscellaneous category. So we've got a broader concept of dementia and a narrower concept, but still a very broad one, so-called Alzheimer's disease or diseases. Okay. So you you quoted as um, arguing that Alzheimer's disease diagnosis, that that diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is scientifically unsound and socially disruptive. I guess you've gone to the science of it, why I think it's unsound, because there's not one condition, but socially disruptive? What do you mean? I mean that we're putting our eggs in one basket. That's to say the medical model of this being a single disease that gives a lot of power to scientists and to doctors and to pharmaceutical companies. This is a process we refer to as medicalization, that you make a social condition, which does cause suffering, into something that is a medical problem, and then you look for medical solutions. So it's disruptive because it narrows the choices we as human beings need to make as we age about our own aging and about how we as communities respond to these challenges that to one degree or another we all face. And do you think that's part of the fact that in, in perhaps particularly in Western societies, we uh, fear aging terribly, we dread it, we do everything we can to try and find the magic bullet to delay it, to put it off, whether that's uh, pharmacological or some other elixir of youth. Is it all tied up with that, that we don't want to see this as an obvious processing of aging? I believe that you're quite correct that rethinking Alzheimer's is about rethinking not only aging, but what it means to be a human being. This notion that, as you said in your introduction, Fran, that uh, Alzheimer's is worse than death. We in the West particularly are uh, fear death. We fear cognitive deterioration. We are a hyper cognitive kind of culture. So Alzheimer's and addressing it, it gets us in touch with the things that, as a neurologist, I don't often talk about, but I think are so important. Issues of the heart, issues of community, issues of what it means to being a frail human being in a world increasingly challenged by so many health problems. So in a perfect world, the treatment of Alzheimer's, or one presenting with the, the elements that we describe as Alzheimer's, what would that treatment be if we're talking about, you know, coming from the heart, not necessarily from the chemist? Well, 
the uh, the treatment lies in human relationships. It lies in communities. It lies in the fact that, as you alluded to earlier, there are societies that think about aging differently, that think about death differently. And if we can have communities that care for older people better, and these communities are sprouting up everywhere, uh, all around the world. People are reorienting to this notion that it is up to us as human beings collectively, not the individual uh, scientist who's going to find a Nobel Prize and make a lot of money to address this problem. So the, it's a high-stakes game because communities that are friendlier to older people are going to be friendlier to children and are going to be friendlier to our, uh, our, our environment, which is so much a part of healthcare today. So, so we're looking states- to redesign communities that, 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 that foster caring relationships. It's 12 past 8 on RM Breakfast. Our guest this morning is Dr. Peter Whitehouse. He's the author of The Myth of Alzheimer's, What You Aren't Being Told About Today's Most Dreaded Diagnosis, and he's in Australia at the moment. Um, It is high stakes, though, in another way, too, because we've done interviews on this program in the past, particularly with uh, a representative from Britain's Alzheimer's Research Research Trust, which was basically putting out an all-points bulletin for more funding for research in this area, talking about the dramatic increase in the incidence of Alzheimer's and that the combined cost of dealing with dementia now exceeds the cost of cancer and heart disease combined in Britain. I mean, it's big dollars at stake here, too. It's big dollars, and that's why it's so important that we figure out how to address them and use those dollars effectively in a, in a world increasingly constrained by um, economic challenges and environmental challenges. For example, we need to look for uh, social interventions that are uh, good for more than just uh, people with dementia. My wife and I in Cleveland started a school, the Intergenerational School. We have scientific data demonstrating that it is valuable for people with mild to moderate to dementia to contribute to the lives of children by going to school, to read children's books, to tell stories from their own lives. So that's a place where we can improve the education of children and give those older folks with memory challenges an opportunity to stay engaged in community and have a sense of purpose. That's what they need. That's what we all need. So you're really talking about trying to make a person with dementia, with onset of dementia, more comfortable in in their dilemma, in what's happening to them, and more supported and more cared for. But does that mean there isn't a pharmacological answer? Does it mean there isn't a Nobel Prize lurking somewhere in finding the drug that will deal with Alzheimer's, that will stop Alzheimer's in its tracks? I believe that that is highly unlikely because of what I said before. This is not a single condition caused by a single problem with one molecule that if you just had the clever scientists figure out how to fix that molecule, we could fix the, the this condition. It's many conditions, and it's related to aging, because may, perhaps this molecule uh, that there was, they're seeking could, you know, cure brain aging. Uh, this is a more complicated biological problem. That's what you're not being told about today's most uh, dreaded diagnosis. And that's why in the conference I'm participating in, the 8th Annual Hammond Care International Conference on Dementia, the, the subtitle is, Do We Need a Different Point of View? Yes, we need lots of different points of view. Okay, so you're saying it's related to aging, but others point out that it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily come with aging. I know the uh, Alzheimer's community in Australia have said that at 85 years of age, in a f- survey they did, three of in four people will not have dementia, but there are 15,000 Australians under 65 years of age who do have some form of dementia. That's correct. There are younger people who have it, and there are a f- relatively few older people, if they live long enough, who will escape it. That's to say, if you look at 85, the statistics are somewhere between 30 and 50 percent. You look at 90, you look at 95, you look at 100, the statistics unfortunately show increasing uh, evidence that as you get older and live longer, you are more likely to have it. Many people believe that if you were to live long enough, and fortunately, uh, I suppose, we don't all live to 110 and become super centenarians, but if if you live that long enough, you are likely to get it. So statistically, it becomes more and more normal as you get older. Your book, when it was published in 2008, created quite a, a furor within your within your sector, within your community, your colleagues. A lot of them didn't like what you were saying, and I presume, presumably the pharmaceutical industry wasn't that wrapped in it. But I wonder, in the two <laughs> years since, has the treatment or approach to Alzheimer's changed at all? Yes. There's no question that the story is changing, as I like to say. By the way, this was not that controversial amongst colleagues. They didn't like the idea that we called it the myth, but the science I've just described is not that controversial. The field is waiting to wake up. The story is changing. The National Alzheimer's Association in the United States is referring to Alzheimer's as an age-related heterogeneous condition. That's basically what we're saying. They're actually saying that we need to start over. Unfortunately, they're putting a larger price tag on it in order to find a cure for things that are more heterogeneous and more related to aging. So they're just continuing the same 
perspective, more money, more uh, opportunities for drugs. That's not the right message in my view. Peter, we've got to go, but I know a lot of people listening will want to know, should they still be doing their crosswords and Sudoku madly? I think they should be volunteering in their communities, helping out children, doing things that are fun and purposeful. And if that includes crossword puzzles and Sudoku, fine. But if it includes volunteering in a school, even better. Peter Whitehouse, thank you very much for joining us. Dr. Peter Whitehouse, Professor Peter Whitehouse, Professor of Neurology at the Case Western Reserve University. He's author of The Myth of Alzheimer's, What You Aren't Being Told, about today's most dreaded diagnosis. And he and his wife, Catherine, are keynote speakers at Hammond Care's 8th Biennial International Conference on Dementia, which is on in Sydney. It's 17 past 8.